and went, you're George. That was the description. Um, I had no idea that at that time that it was any kind of an alter ego for Larry David. Would never have dawned on me. Um, I, I went through easily the first five, six, seven episodes of that show with Woody Allen in the back of my mind. Just going, that's your guide. You know, use those sensibilities and perceptions and you'll muscle through this. One of these days I've got to go back and try and figure out what episode it was, but it was within the first eight episodes where... It's interesting, you know, every... Some people think Seinfeld rewrote the book on how to do a sitcom. That's not actually true. Most of the elements in Seinfeld had been done before. We may have been cobbling them together in a, in a different way, but, you know, Burns and Allen used to do the curtain speech in front of the curtain, just like Jerry would do the stand-up. That, so that bookend was there. Um, what was different about Seinfeld in its construction was, at that time, sitcom writing was very clean. There was an A story and a B story. And you teed up the A story in the pre-tease, then you rolled your credits. Then you did a story about the A with one mention of the B. Scene two was the B story, blah, blah, blah. By the time you came to the next commercial break, you had set up the tension moments of the A and B story. You come back, you finish the A story, you go to commercial, you come back, you finish the B story, and you roll the credits. That's how every sitcom was done. These guys weren't writing like that. So they would start an A, B, and C story, and B and C would never resolve. Uh, or A and C would never resolve, and only B would resolve. Um, or you'd be hard-pressed to find the A story. It was just a series of events with no particular driving story to it, no particular conflict, no particular anything. So. At the time, as, as we were all being greeted with these scripts, we were, we, Julia, and, well, Ju certainly Julia and I would scratch our heads and go, well, what's going on here? You know, this is really strange. They would write me a conflict that was heated and never resolve it. And I went, I'd go, Larry, you've got to resolve this. And he said, it's not funny after that. I go, well, but... You can't, the character. And he went, it's not about characters. It's about funny. And, and, and that was like, what, this guy's from another planet. What do you mean it's not about characters? I'm only playing a character. I have to come back next week. I have to have continuity. No, you don't. <laughs> he, didn't care if there, he didn't care if I did one thing this week and the polar opposite the next week, if it was funny. And to me, the trained actor, I'm going, you can't do that. Somewhere in those first eight episodes, they wrote a scenario where George got into a situation which I thought was completely unlikely and then reacted to it in a way that I thought was for writing purposes only because no human being would do this. And I went to Larry after the table read and I said, Larry, please help me. First of all, this wouldn't happen to anybody. But if it did, no one would react like this. And Larry looked at me and went, what are you talking about? This happened to me? This is exactly what I did. And that was when the bell went off in my head. And I went, oh, jeez. He's George. He's George. He's writing George. That's when I got introduced to the Larry David notebooks, where almost everything, some element of every story we did on Seinfeld came out of something that happened to him. And that's when Woody Allen went away and I started to laser focus on what makes Larry Larry and incorporate as much of it as I could into the building of that character. So that's when it all clicked. And I, I, one of these days I'll go back and look at the, the titles of the shows and go, well, it must have been that one. A lot of the comedy of Seinfeld happens between the lines. And for George, the reason it does that is because my perception of Larry at the time <laughs> was that for him, he is constantly weighing whether someone has just attacked him or diminished him. So first he has to weigh that, and then he has to weigh whether or not a response is worthwhile. And in that weighing process, he does something physically. And if you've watched Curve, you see it all the time. The physicality of it is he puts his tongue 
at the bottom of his bottom teeth, and he and he makes this face, and he goes. <laughs> that was my clue to George. So, what would happen is there was lots of zingers being written into the script. But they were like Superman bullets. They were either absorbed or they bounced off. Nobody ever went, ah, ah, you just took a shot. That sensibility of, I see what you did. Uh, you took a shot at me. You're supposed to be my friend, and you just took a shot. That became a big part of, of the energy of the ensemble, the noting those things, noting that we were all supposedly friends with a comedian who would be doing things like that having that reality. Um, the other thing about Larry that was so remarkable to me, I'd never seen anybody balance these things, was Larry carried, I don't know if he still does, but carried both an incredible sense of worthlessness, that he was just a horrible, useless, untalented, unattractive human being, alongside the most overinflated ego, that everything he said and did was of the utmost importance and significance and value, and that everything else was diminished in comparison. But those two things were side by side, in the same package. So he could be declarative and abrasive in one second, and then turn around and go, too much? Uh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> We actually did this on Seinfeld, but it's because Larry really did it. This is who he is, and this is who George is. He quit Saturday Night Live as a writer in a volcanic eruption of obscenities, telling the boss to go stick things everywhere you can stick things and, you know, perform a natural act, and just this, this horrible torrent of obscenity on a Friday. Got home to his apartment and went, what have I done? <laughs> now I don't have a job. I'm unemployed. <laughs> and he's talking to Kenny Kramer, the real Kramer. And Kenny goes, just go back to work on Monday. And Larry goes, what do you mean? He goes, just go back. Like nothing happened. Just go back. Well, what happens when they say, you know, you quit and you cursed us a lot? You just go, what, you, you believe that? I was joking. I was, I was making a joke. And that's what Larry did. That ego, that ability to stand on a soapbox and curse out the world and then literally crawl on your hands and knees under this thin, thinly veiled lie on Monday morning going, I was kidding, I was kidding. That's, that's George. That's George. And the only difference, I think, between my George and Larry's George is there was... I think the balance was a little more on the I'm worthless, I have nothing to offer, than the soapbox. Uh, and on Curb, Larry leans on the soapbox because that show is about living in the land of the uncomfortable. But that's the only difference.